everyone, and welcome to episode 21 of the True Crime All the Time Unsolved podcast. I'm Mike Ferguson, and with me as always is my partner in true crime, Mike Gibson. Gibby, how are you today? Hey, Mike. I'm doing good, man. Excited to be here. Episode 21? 21. Wow, and Saul's really, really got up there now. It's kind of hard to believe. It, it's really hard to believe for me. For you. For me, that's right. All right, Gib, so let's dive into our case today, and it's pretty fascinating. It's the Waltham Triple Murders. Now, it's interesting for a number of reasons, but I think the main one is who some of the suspects turn out to be because these are very well-known people that, and we're going to get into it. I don't want to spoil it right away. But the other thing about this is it's an unsolved case, but there's a lot of people that feel like they know who committed this crime. And we're, we'll get into that as well. And it is intriguing. That's, I mean, it's what drew me to this case was a lot of the, 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 the back details. Yeah, no, there's no doubt about it. So we said it's a triple murder. And these murders took place on Harding Avenue in Waltham, Massachusetts on September 11th, 2011. Now that's a big day, right? September 11th. Yeah. Everybody remembers that. Everybody remembers that. Now it's 2011. Right. It's 10 year. This is the 10 year anniversary of 9-11. The bodies would be discovered on September 12th, the next day. So Gibbs, let's talk a little bit about Waltham just to give the listeners that are not from the Boston area a little idea of what we're talking about. It is the part of the greater Boston area, 20 minutes max, probably right from downtown. Yeah, I'd say so. There's a lot of public transportation in Boston, so pretty easy to get around. My mom grew up in South Boston. Did she? Yeah, she's a Southie. Southie, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That make, are, you like, are you like Goodwill hunting? I, yeah, I'm actually, I am Goodwill hunting. How do you like them apples? That's right. All right, Gib. So like we always do, we want to focus a little bit on the victims. And there are three of them. The first one is a man named Brendan Mess. And Brendan was 25 years old. He lived in Waltham at the time. I think he originally was from Cambridge, which... Not very far either. Born in 1986. You know, he had a mom and a dad. He had a brother. He had a family that loved him. And when you read some stuff about Brendan, a lot of what you see is that he was like a real gregarious type guy. You know, he was funny, outgoing. And it was also said that he was very intelligent. And he actually got his bachelor's degree from Champlain College in 2008. But one of the really interesting things about Brendan is that he was a mixed martial arts fighter. He was a really good fighter. I mean, very well known in that area. And this is something that we're going to see, or it's, it, this is part of this group, right? These were, well, let's start, let's just stay on Brendan for now. This guy was not an easy target, right? He's a, a, a well-accomplished mixed martial arts fighter. This is not the typical person that you're going to want to go after. I agree. You'd steer away from this type of guy. There is no doubt about it. If I'm a person targeting victims, the last person in the world that I want to target is somebody that makes their living or enjoys being in the octagon. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to be at the top of my list. I yeah. can tell you that right now. Don't go in the cage. I, I, I love UFC and I love all that MMA fighting. I watch it a lot. Those guys are bad asses. There is no two ways about it. And you know, those guys can, not only can they give a pounding, man, they can take a freaking pounding. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not the person that you want to go after. No. I really hope there's not a lot of memes of, <laughs> of you, Gib, saying, give a pounding, take a pounding. That wouldn't be good. That's not good for anybody. That is not. And I know that's not what you meant. The next victim, Gibbs, we have to talk about, his name was Eric Weissman. And Eric was 31 years old at the time, born in 1980, very active in his synagogue. Again, well-liked guy, had a lot of friends. I mean, you can see... 
you know, a lot of stuff out there about what type of guy he was. But here again, Eric Weissman was a bodybuilder. Yeah. A, a very strong guy. Not somebody you would target. I wouldn't think you would. I mean, I've been around some bodybuilders, man, and I wouldn't want to mess with them. No, you again, you're not picking fights with martial arts guys and bodybuild. Those are the guys you leave alone. Yeah. You say, hey, let me buy you a beer. Everything's all right. Not saying I couldn't win, but I wouldn't want to put myself through that. You're taking a you're taking a hell of a chance. Yeah, but I got a K bar. No, oh, that's true. It's how I leverage myself. So the third victim was Raphael Tekken, and Raphael was 37. So these three guys, you know, about six years apart exactly. From Brendan 25, Eric 31, Raphael 37. He was born in 73. And Raphael was the son of a rabbi, grew up in Brookline, Mass. It was said that he was on the swim team at his high school. And then he went on to Brandeis University, majored in history, and graduated from there in 1998. So again, another intelligent individual. Yeah. And the thing about Raphael... He wasn't a mixed martial artist. He wasn't a bodybuilder, but he was a personal trainer. So these are not couch potatoes sitting around eating Cheetos all day. No, these are these are physical, active men. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, you know, it was said that Raphael basically spent most of his life in the gym. He played a lot of basketball. So just to back your point up, Gibbs, he was a very active guy. Now, the one thing we have to talk about is that all three of these victims were Jewish. And it was said that Raphael's body was actually taken to Israel to be buried. And the reason why I think we have to point out the fact that all three are Jewish is because it's going to come into play possibly when we start talking about suspects. Yeah, I think I think it definitely comes into play. For me. So I think we have to set it up yes. that way. So let's talk about this crime because it was a very brutal crime. So we mentioned that all three of the men were found on September 12th and they were found with their throats cut and it was described as ear to ear. I mean, to the point where they were nearly decapitated. That's how vicious this attack was. And it was thought that the murder weapon was a knife or could have possibly been a nice pick. And I don't know how the hell you cut somebody from ear to ear with an ice pick, but I don't either. I mean, I can understand stabbing somebody with an ice pick. So I don't know, Gibbs, I got to go knife probably on know. that. I'm thinking knife as well. But I mean, you do see it online as possibly being an ice pick. You do. So as if that was not bad enough, the way these guys were, viciously murdered we got to talk about how their their bodies were found because it's very strange all three of the men are found in different rooms now this is brendan mess's apartment is where they're found each found in a different room and this is the part i couldn't get over it was said that their bodies were sprinkled with a whole bunch of cash i mean i saw five thousand I saw 7,000, it was a lot of money. And on top of that, seven to eight pounds of marijuana. So you just have to picture this scene. You've got three men in three different rooms, nearly decapitated with wads of cash and marijuana dumped on them. Now it was said, Gibbs, that seven or eight pounds of marijuana was worth more than $5,000. I don't know much about the street prices of marijuana. I know you do, but that's just that's uh, that's a lot of money there, man. A lot of product. Well, it is, and and what does that mean? Well, what I think it what it does tell you is that this wasn't a robbery. No, because a robber is sure as hell not going to leave behind five thousand dollars in cash, and most likely is not going to leave behind seven or eight pounds of marijuana that they know they can easily sell. Right. For another, however much that's worth. That's a lot of, it's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. And I don't think they would go through 
the method of killing that they went through for that amount of money in, in marijuana. I just don't think there's easier ways to kill than try to decapitate somebody. Well, and it was said by investigators that this dumping of the money, the dumping of the marijuana, that it had to have been some type of symbolic act, right? It had to mean something. Was it a drug deal gone bad? Because that's one thing we haven't talked about. These were good kids, good, good guys. I mean, one of the guys is 37 years old, but at least one or more of them were known to be drug dealers. That's true. So I think that lends itself maybe to possibly being thought of originally as a drug deal gone bad. Yeah, I can see where, you know, easily you can look at it as a drug deal gone bad, right? But I think if, I just think if it was a drug deal gone bad, they would have left with at least the cash or at least the product, if not both. If I, not both. Yeah, I don't. I just don't know if this was a drug deal gone bad after you did your damage, why you go through all that and not, you know, take what, what was there. I mean, even if you were trying to send a message to other dealers, that's the only thing I can think of. If it, if it really was some type of symbolic gesture and it was worth more to send a message than it was to actually have that 10, $15,000 total. That's the only thing I can think of. If you go down that path. Yeah. But I just don't see I mean, I would think almost decapitating each individual would send a very clear message. That is true. So that on its own. But, you know, really in the distribution game, I guess 5,000 and seven pounds of marijuana to, the, you know, a cartel or to, you know, any type of organized crime probably isn't a lot of money to them that they can go ahead and leave that there and try to make it more of a symbolic warning yeah, I would agree with you on that. So we talked about these three men being very physically active, big guys, guys you didn't want to mess with. But it was said that, and they could tell when they did the forensic analysis, that these guys were dragged all over the apartment from either where they were killed to each one of these rooms. So that tells me that you're dealing with either multiple people or you're dealing with some pretty big individuals themselves. Yeah. I would say to drag a bodybuilder around an MMA fighter. Yeah. You'd have to have some, you know, some strength to you. And like you said, be at least as big as them, I would think. But not only did they drag them around to the different rooms or him or her or that, whoever the, you know, we haven't gotten suspects yet, but they had to do what they did without but they had to they had to do what they did without alerting neighbors i mean no physical evidence of them left there well and not just neighbors i mean this is an apartment building yeah so we're not talking neighbors like in a residential subdivision right i mean these are there's a lot of people in close proximity and maybe we're foreshadowing a little bit or maybe we'll talk about it but that kind of maybe plays into who the possible killer or killers could be. Because one of the things is to be able to do that. Did they know these people, you know, did, were the, were the killers known to the victims? Because if that's the case, then that makes a little more sense of how you're able to get inside. You're maybe hanging out with these people and you take them by surprise and end up slashing their throats. Yeah. I just don't know how you take, all of them by surprise. Depends on how many people you got oh, with that's you. That's true. All right, Gibbs. So we have to talk a little bit about how the three were found. We know it was September 12th. And to set it up, we have to go back a little bit. And there's a story about Brendan Mess and his girlfriend that, you know, prior to this incident, they had gotten into what was described as a pretty violent fight. It was said that she was throwing knives and beer bottles at him in the apartment. And after this fight, she actually traveled to another state. And it was on September 12th that she returned to the apartment in Waltham. And when she entered, she made this discovery. I mean, which had to have been just horrific. Yeah, I couldn't imagine, man, walking into something like that. You know, I've had people mad at me before, women. 
I know it's hard to believe. That is not hard to believe. But I've never had them want to throw knives at me. Wait a minute. Are you saying they haven't wanted to throw knives at you? Or are you saying they haven't thrown knives at you? I'm saying they... Because that's a big difference. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. They haven't. I'm just saying... But you don't know that maybe they did want to. I don't know. All right. How could they? Look at this face. Would you want to throw a knife at it? I I do right now. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) So let's jump into talking about the investigation a little bit and some of the facts that would come out from investigators. So they learned that the three individuals, they were at Mess's apartment that night to watch a football game. New York Jets, Dallas Cowboys. And one of the key points of evidence that they used to kind of put this timeline together was the cell phone records of the three men. They knew that all three were texting about the game as it was going on. And they know that at 8 54 p.m., a food order was placed to a restaurant called Jerry's Italian Kitchen. And the, it was for three dinners to be delivered to Mess's apartment. They know that. They do. Yep. And this came from Eric Weissman's cell phone. The delivery person got to the apartment about 9 15. There was no answer at the door. Nobody answered the phone when the restaurant called. And this is how they're putting the time of the murder somewhere around nine o'clock. That's a pretty tight window though. So if he makes the call at eight 54 and the delivery driver shows up at nine 14, well, that's not true because we don't know if the killers were still inside. They could have still been there. They could have. Sure. I was thinking that was like a 20 minute window for the kill to happen, but that's not true. Yeah. We just know no one answered the door. Right. And we know we know that presumably Weissman was alive at 8:54 to place this order. So that's where they're they're ballparking it at around 9 p.m. Right. The other thing that investigators knew, and we kind of hinted about this, Gibbs, that one or more of these individuals were known to have been involved in drugs. And one of the things they knew was that in 2008, Weissman was charged with possession of marijuana and intent to distribute, which which means he had enough product on him. Right. To get that charge. I don't know how it works in Massachusetts specifically, but normally to get intent to distribute, you have to have at least X amount of ounces. Yeah. I I defer to your marijuana knowledge on that. But now we talked about the possibility that this was maybe either a drug deal gone bad or somebody trying to, you know, stop them from dealing drugs or something like that. But there was a lot of, most people I don't believe think that's the case Gibbs, because, you know, as part of this 2008 arrest and, and all of that, one thing that Weissman did not do, he didn't cut a plea deal and he didn't roll over on anybody else. So it doesn't mean it didn't happen, but it definitely means it wasn't, it wouldn't have been because of this charge that he got. And I think the other thing that led the police to thinking that, you know, probably all three were into drugs or or dealt drugs or something like that is all the interviews they did with neighbors. When they interviewed the neighbors of all three men there, they got a lot of information from neighbors about the fact that there was just a steady stream of people coming in and out of each man's place. In 2010, Brendan Mess, he was arrested on assault charges. I think one of the most telling things, Gibbs, is that the police come out very early on during the investigation and they make a statement saying that they believe that both the assailants and the three murder victims knew each other and that these murders were not random. So it kind of goes back to what we were talking about, possible theory. Yeah, I mean, I think you said it early on that these guys had to be comfortable around whoever did this because it wasn't like they let somebody in the door with a machete that came in and just sliced them, right? I mean, this is somebody that took them by surprise after they were already in the apartment. I would agree. And to back that up, police didn't find any evidence of a break-in. 
So I think that even furthers the theory that the perpetrators were let in, most likely because they were known to the victims. Now, the investigators also had some witness information because there were witnesses that saw two men at the apartment before the murders, not the three victims, two other unidentified men. And this witness would go on to say and further kind of this theory that it appeared that all of these people knew each other. Yeah. So were they over there to catch the game together? Were they over there to pick up a couple ounces? Right. We don't know. We don't know. We just. But most likely they were known. These are not strangers, random people knocking on the door. And, and these three guys are saying, yeah, come on in. Yeah, and there was even some neighbors nearby that had their windows open that whole night, and they didn't even hear anything. I think you would hear, like, fighting or some screams or yelling, something. So, again, it it, it baffles me on uh, how this was done. Yeah, so if you have an MMA fighter, a bodybuilder, and a personal trainer trying to fight off one, two, or more attackers in an apartment building... I have a feeling, Gibbs, that's going to be a pretty loud affair. Yeah, I think people would hear it, you know, neighbors above, below, next door, whatever, however the setup is, right? You'd think somebody would hear something. It's going to be crashing. There's going to be yeah. people thrown into walls. So, I again, I go back to the fact that I just don't feel like it went down that way. I feel like it had to have been some type of ambush situation because the three victims felt comfortable enough with with whoever was in their house. All right, Gibbs, we've talked about the victims. We've talked about the crime. We've talked about some of the evidence that came out during the investigation. Now we have to talk about three men. We're going to talk about a man named Ibrahim Todeshev. We're going to talk about a man named Tamerlan Sarnayev. And we're going to talk about his brother, Jokar Sarnaya. Now, most people are going to recognize those last two names. Oh, especially if they're from that area. Because Tamerlan and Jokar Sarnayev were the two men behind the Boston bombings. And I know you have, you remember it just like I do, Gibbs. Sure do. I mean, everybody in this country remembers it. It was the worst attack on U.S. soil since 9-11. And you remember the outpouring of support and Boston Strong and and you remember all of that stuff. Absolutely. But that's what makes this case so fascinating. We're not talking about some random guys here. These are the guys that we know committed the Boston bombing. So I just want to set that up as we walk through this. Let's start out talking about Ibrahim Todeshev because Todeshev was a mixed martial arts fighter, just like Brendan Mess. He was 25 years old at the time. And it was said that he was a friend of all three of the victims. And he was from Chechnya, just like we know the Sarnaya brothers were. We know they were Chechnyan too. One thing we haven't talked about, Gibbs, is that this case went pretty cold for a while. It did, yep. And it's not until May 22nd of 2013. So that's, you know, over a year and a half from the time of the murders that this Ibrahim Todeshev gets on law enforcement radar. And it's on this day that law enforcement officers, FBI agents, police, state police, there's a bunch of people that go to his apartment And keep in mind, at this point, he's living in Orlando, Florida. And they travel to his apartment to interview him about the Waltham triple murders. And it's said that they're questioning him for, you know, six to eight hours. And at one point, he is starting to write out a formal statement that implicates himself and Tamerlan Sarnayev in the murders in Waltham. But as he's doing this, he asks to take a break. And then very suddenly, he attacks an FBI agent. And that's not a good thing to do. Never good to do. Especially with a bunch of people sitting around your apartment that have guns. Right. 
and this guy ends up getting shot and killed by officers. Tonight, a deadly connection. A man with ties to one of the Boston Marathon bombing suspects is shot and killed by the FBI. And it happened as he was being questioned in Florida for a triple murder that happened here in Waltham. 27-year-old Ibrahim Tadashev, also from Chechnya, CBS sources say had just implicated himself and Tamerlan Sarnayev in an unsolved grisly triple murder here in Waltham. Investigators, they say, then pushed for a full confession, and shortly after that, he was dead. Brandon Mess, Eric Wiseman, and Raphael Tekken were murdered September 11, 2011. Their throats slashed with marijuana and cash sprinkled on their bodies. CBS has learned the FBI, two mass state troopers, and a joint terrorism task force agent went to Ibrahim Tadashev's Orlando apartment with strong evidence to suggest that he, along with Tamerlan and Johar Sarnayev, were involved in the Waltham killings. Tadashev lived in Boston at the time, trained with Tamerlan at a local gym. There's no proof he knew anything about the bombings, but his friend said he'd been on the FBI's radar ever since. Sources told CBS during questioning, Tadashev became angry and showed a knife. They say the FBI agent from Boston shot and killed him. So you hear in that clip, Gib, that they say that he has a knife. And you do see reports of that out there. You will also see some reports that believe that he was unarmed when he was killed. But either way, it doesn't really matter if you have a knife or you're unarmed. If he really did attack an FBI agent and they had every right to defend themselves. Yeah, especially with a MMA individual coming after you, right? Those guys can be deadly. Yeah, so we have to talk about the agent. You know, he did have minor injuries. He required some stitches. The FBI did a post-shooting review, which they're always going to do when something like this happens. And they cleared all of the law enforcement people involved. Now, we have to talk about this confession because, and you hear it on the tape, Right. So it's said that Todeshev confessed to the crime. The problem is he didn't get to finish out the written part of it. He was just a little bit of the ways into writing this out. And this is where a little bit of the problem comes in, because some of the things that he put in this partial confession didn't match some of the things at the crime scene, the evidence that they already had. I think at, at one point. He talked about taping the hands of the victims, but the forensic evidence didn't find that there was any signs that the hands had been bound or tied up or duct tape used on them or anything like that. The other thing that was a little strange is in the confession, he talks about a gun, but at no point does he talk about slitting the throats of the three victims. And then I think the last part is that what he did get through he said that the motivation for the the murders was robbery. But like you and I talked in the beginning, if that's what you're there for and you're taking lives, you're not going to leave $5,000 or a whole bunch of weed that you can sell. I wouldn't think so, unless there was a million dollars there and you left five back to throw people off. But I'm trying to, I'm having a hard time figuring out how somebody would have so much money that that would even be considered a, a possibility. The law enforcement sources are making this nexus to NBC News between the man who was shot and killed here and the dead Boston bombing suspect, believing that indeed they committed this triple murder in uh, just outside Boston in 2011. They say that the man here, Tadashev, was actually filling out a confession, had been cooperative, then all of a sudden he turned and attacked the FBI agent. Last night, the FBI confirms they were questioning Tadashev in connection with the Boston Marathon bombings when he attacked an agent who shot and killed him. While living in Boston, his friends confirmed Tadashev met bombing suspect Tamerlan Sarniev through MMA fighting, but did not share his ideology. They say the FBI had been following Tadashev here, and he was scared. He felt like there's going to be set up. He felt like there's going to be set up bad setup against him, you know what I mean? Because he felt, he told me like they're making up such a crazy stuff, I don't know why they're doing it. He just told me, take the numbers, right? In case something happens, if I get locked up or whatever. So a couple of clips there that I, I just thought were interesting. You know, the, the first one was kind of some repeat information of the one that we played earlier on. But what it did, what it does is it leads us into Todeshev's relationship with 
Tamerlan Tsarnaev. Now, the timeline of this is a, is a little strange, right? Because at this point in time, it's after the Boston Marathon bombings. And we know that during that time period, Tamerlan Tsarnaev, he was the older brother. He was the one that was killed by police after the bombings. So Gibbs, we have to talk about the fact that Tamerlan Tsarnaev and Brendan Mess were best described as best friends. Yeah, they were really close. So because they were really good friends, Tamerlan, he was over at Mess's apartment a lot where the murders took place. And it was said that they were even possibly roommates for a period of time. Now we have to go back, Gibbs, and talk about Brendan Mess's girlfriend. Because I think it's very important. This is the woman that found all three victims. And because Tamerlan and Mess were friends, Tamerlan also became friends with Brendan Mess's girlfriend. And she came from the Sudan. It was talked a lot in the research gives about her Islamic beliefs and the fact that she had a real hatred for American values. Yeah, I did. I saw that in quite a few places in my research. Now we know the Sarnayevs were Muslim and Tamerlan and Brendan Mess's girlfriend, they got to be really close and became pretty good friends. And it was said that this woman was extremely aggressive, very violent and radical in her way of thinking. I mean, I, I think Gibbs that she hated America or American values. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I think I, I think you're exactly right. And and I, what I'm wondering is how much of that rubbed off on Tamerlan or was he already starting to feel that way and the two of them together were sharing kind of feeding off of each other for this hatred of, because eventually Tamerlan and Brendan mess, they kind of have a falling out and it's over Brendan's lifestyle. So Gibbs, we've talked about Tamerlan's relationship with mess, but it goes deeper than that because go, go all, all the way back to high school. And you find out that Brendan mess, Eric Weissman and both the Sarnayev brothers went to the same high school. Yeah, small world, man. So, I mean, there's no doubt that these people knew each other. They ran in the same circles and had for some time. And that makes sense. Maybe why the whole, you know, the uh, Jewish and Muslim um, religions weren't an issue with them both, you know, getting along, being friends and everything. Because it seemed like they got along. Right. Despite maybe having some ideological differences, they were friends from everything you read. Now, that may have changed at some point in time, but up to that time, it seemed like they all got along. So we talked about all this MMA fighting, right? Mess was into it. Tamerlan was into it. They were really good friends. And the reason why we're harping on this, Gibbs, is because after the murder of the three individuals, Tamerlan was said to have been very unemotional about the death of his, what everybody described as really good friend. And also he didn't go to the memorial service. He didn't attend the funeral. So that's kind of strange. Yeah. I guess he was kind of cold about the whole thing. Really? Like that, you said, that, unemotional. that's the way it kind of read. Yeah. Separating himself from them. It seems like because you know, they're training together at, at doing this martial arts stuff. And right after the murder, Tamerlan stops going to the, the martial arts place where he worked out. So you got a lot of weird things happening all at, you know, after this time of the murder. And I think he, it was even said that he made a statement, something like, I don't have American friends, which is a strange statement when everybody said he and Brendan mess were really good friends. Yeah. I mean, he grew up in the United States, so why would you say something like that unless you're going over or have went over to the radical side? So like we said, Gibbs, it's after the Boston Marathon bombings that all of this connection is made and some of this stuff starts to come out because the murder case in Waltham is being reexamined and this is where they're starting to look at 
both the Sarnayev brothers, Tamerlan and Jokar, and as we talked about, Ibrahim Todeshev as all three possible suspects in these murders. And there's some evidence that comes out about the Zarnayev brothers, because you know they were investigated to an unbelievable degree because of the Boston bombings. Oh, absolutely. So ABC would come out in April of 2013 and say that there was forensic evidence that connected both the Zarnayev brothers to the scene of the killings. And the other big thing they had, Gibbs, is they had their cell phone records, which put them in the area. Just two pretty good pieces of evidence. Yeah, it's pretty compelling. Now, the problem is that, you know, like we know, Tamerlan was killed, and Jokar, at this point in time, is already in custody awaiting trial. And as we know, he's later going to be convicted for his role in the Boston bombing. Till now, on the day he was to be sentenced to die, this apology. I am sorry for the lives that I have taken, for the suffering that I've caused you, for the damage that I've done. And from him, this stunning confession. If there's any lingering doubt, I did do it, along with my brother. And affirming his Muslim faith, he added, I prayed for Allah to bestow his mercy upon the deceased, those affected in the bombing, and their families. I pray for your relief, for your healing. Now, that was Joe Carr. Now, he's not confessing to the Waltham murders. That was him at his Boston bombing trial. So, Gibbs, just a couple more things about Joe Carr and Tamerlan. Now, we know Joe Carr was sentenced to death for his role in the Boston bombing. But we also know that he put most of the blame on his brother, Tamerlan. And there were a lot of people that came out and said that Tamerlan was the leader and that Jokar was the follower. All right, Gibbs, we know Todeshev is dead. We know Tamerlan Sarnayev is dead. And we know that Jokar is convicted of the Boston bombings. Now, it was said that they had all of this evidence that put the three of them as pretty good suspects for these murders, but they did not want to move forward in any way against Jokar because they didn't want to take a chance of it messing up the Boston bombing case in any way. There was a lot of stuff out there about that. And I can get that, right? Why would you want to put anything into jeopardy? Because if you get the conviction on the bombing, it it does the same thing that you, that would happen by going after the other case. I mean, at the end, if your strongest case is the bombing, you're going to get the better outcome. Well, and also by opening up this Waltham case, it was said that it could have given the defense of Jokar some ammunition that they didn't want them to have. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there is because people are probably wondering, you know, if you have all this information, if you had, if they had all this evidence, why did they not move forward? Why is this technically still an unsolved case? And I think that's one of the biggest reasons. I don't know if they could have made the case or not, but I know it was said that they didn't even want to try because they didn't want to jeopardize the big case, which was the Boston bombing. Yeah, and I think any prosecutor listening to this would agree that it was best to take the avenue of the bombing case to get the conviction if they thought he had anything if he had any involvement into the murders, triple murders that they their best avenue again was to go after the bombing evidence. So because of that, this is still an unsolved case and technically it remains open. Yeah. And I think that's you know when we first talked about the case in the opening, we said you know, it's it's a unique one. It's interesting, right? Because there's a lot of people that feel they have the suspects. They have the people guilty for it. They know who did it. But we can't say for sure that's true, right? Well, and also, I mean, the Massachusetts Attorney General has come out and said that they believe there may be other suspects. Now, I don't know if that is... In addition to Todeshev and some, you know, combination of Tamerlan and Jokar, or they're saying that these sp- suspects are better than them. 
That that part I don't know. Right. And we're I don't think we're ever going to know. But I think when she came out and said that there are other suspects, that that was very surprising to a lot of people. And I would imagine Gibbs it was especially surprising to the families of the victims because I think they probably at some point were kind of resigned to the fact that most likely it was Todeshev and the Zar- Zarnayevs or one of the Zarnayevs or some combination. Yeah, I think that they thought the case was over. Right? They, f- I think they really believed that they had, they knew who who did it and that it was resolved. And I think that's just what people want, right? They want closure. And in this case, if it really was, you know, Todeshev and the Zarnayevs, it's going to be hard to get closure. I agree. I, I think if others were involved, they should consider themselves extremely lucky because I think that it will probably never be known that they were involved. So hopefully they make good with the rest of their lives for the bad stuff they did. (laughs) Said stuff. Stuff. Yeah. All right, Gibbs. So that's the case of the Waltham triple murders. You know, horrible what happened to those three victims. Absolutely. But fascinating when you think about who was or may have been involved all indications, I think, point to some of these people being involved that just happen to have been the perpetrators by, uh, behind this heinous Boston bombing. Yeah, yeah. And, and I know that's what drew you to this case because you picked this one. Yep. And again, I, I thought it was very interesting as well. Yeah, just really intriguing to me. All right, so for Mike. And Gibbs. Stay safe and keep your own time ticking.